I just mentioned my co-author, uh, Julia Cothouse, uh, who is with us today. Uh, this presentation uses the work of many individuals, and some of the key players are acknowledged here. But first of all, where is Farndon Fields? Uh, it's the orange dot on the River Trent, in blue here, um, shown with Britain as a peninsula of Europe. Uh, other dots are Creswellian clusters. If we zoom into the Trent uh, to locate you, um, we just heard about Bradgate Park, which is the green dot at the bottom of the slide. And uh, Creswell Crags, we've heard something about that already today, uh, the red dot. Um, Fondham Fields is the orange dot between them on the Trent, um, upstream of the Trent as it goes into the River Humber and the well-known site of Risby Warren at the top of the screen. To zoom further into the Fondham geography, um, the late upper Paleolithic scatter is located on an interflue between the rivers Trent and Devon, uh, both marked here in their policy floodplains. The known preserved late glacial deposits are by the River Devon, um, towards the bottom of the slide, um, noticeably not by the higher energy Trent with its wide policy floodplain. The late Upper Paleolithic scatter was first discovered in 1991 by field walking by Trent and Peak Archaeological Trust ahead of a new road development for the A46. This was initially commissioned by English Heritage and then various consultants for the Highways Agency. The late Upper Paleolithic material was obvious because of its large size and distinctive white buff patina or cortication, depending on which school you come from, which, when broken, reveals a dark translucent flint. As planning policy, the road designers avoided the obvious clusters, like that called the North Cluster, arrowed here, on a local high spot on the gravel terrace. By 1994, this seemed mostly to be in plough soil. Some thought that the flattish topography of the surface, there's a maximum height difference on this slide of about two metres, meant that the field walking reflected all of the Lake Paleolithic archaeology. This was despite areas being mapped as alluvium, albeit labelled Holocene, by the British Geological Survey. In the event, the in situ scatters, which uh, were recorded by Wessex archaeology, marked here in red dot, were recovered in an alluvial embayment in a blank between the field walking scatters. One clear result is that the BGS mapping is not sufficiently detailed for archaeological purposes, and their mapping geologists point out but many different deposit types have to be grouped. And importantly, any deposits less than a metre depth are not included on published maps. The A46 fieldwork for the road, led by Chris Ellis for Cotswold Wessex Archaeology, recovered two in situ napping scatters some three metres apart in the alluvial sediments. The stratigraphically earlier group all corticated, patinated to some degree, included blades, cores, crested, and preparation pieces within a tight cluster of micro debitage, but no retouched tools. The raw material and technology closely reflects the wider scatter of corticated material found field walking. And to illustrate that, Phil Harding published his refits alongside a platform faceted core from field walking. The material was designated Creswellian by Phil Harding. The stratigraphically later group also had clusters of micro debitage, but lay within a wider scatter of blades, cores, and tools, a piercer, a burial fragment, and scrapers. This latter group has iron staining rather than being corticated white buff and used gravel flint of poorer quality. The material was designated Federmesser by Phil Harding. 
The scatter contained burnt flint, burnt mineral, and microcharcoal, and Harding suggested two possible hard foci. Julia, my co-author, has conducted a blind analysis of the technology of these two groups. There was no obvious bimodality, despite the observed stratigraphic and patination variability. That said, most of the corticated scrapers from field walking are made on regular blades, quite different from those left in the Fedemessa A46 cluster. But were these for an intended different purpose, a reflection of the vagaries of transported raw material, or chronology? The upshot for field walking collections is that we must be content with the general layer of Paleolithic attribution, the mass of items, at least until we have more demonstrably single episode assemblages as comparators. This is the only known place in England where two distinct late Upper Paleolithic occupations are stratigraphically superimposed and cave sites. And although it's recognised of national importance in the literature of historic England, the quirks of the scheduling legislation does not allow this form of designation. There is no public involvement in the A46 work. Post-construction, the Fund and Community Group was funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund to continue to investigate the site and promote its importance to the wider community through the banner Ice Age Journeys. I was lucky enough to be part of that group, supported by Ursula Spence, County Council Archaeologist, alongside other colleagues. Our activities included field walking, bordering and test pitting. Here we illustrate two test pit groups, some 20 metres apart, that contained lithics of late the Paleolithic character. Both groups included long end scrapers. The green test pit also included a piercer, a denticulated blade, and had double the proportion of burnt items, about 11%, compared with the grey test pit. The grey test pit includes a double end burin and a button eperon characteristic of the Creswellian. We interpret this part of the scatter as comprising multiple episodes, much like those found in the A46, which lies some 350 metres to the south. Uh, this is a LIDAR plot of the site. Um, the grey and red is the highest, uh, the blue the lowest levels within that two metre band. The sediment type and height of our test pits suggests that the alluvial embayment was more than double the extent of the published BGS mapping. This is because the alluvial sediments are less than a metre thick. The extent of the late upper, late upper panel scatter with eight known clusters now covers over 18 hectares, the largest extent in England. And that does not include several outlying single finds, which we've not been able to investigate yet, but hint at an even wider spread of activity. Our model, suggested by the late Roger Jacobi, is of hunter-gatherers returning to a place where they knew that the herds habitually crossed the rivers Deeby and Trent between Doggerland and the putative carving grounds in the peak. The dominance of scrapers in the collection suggests carcass or hide processing. This evidence of repeated visits, we think, merits the term persistent place as coined by a link from this Mesolithic activity. We'll come back to this later. One consistent feature of both A46 and Ice Age Journeys clusters is their stratigraphic position perilously close to the base of modern ploughing. Since 1991, we can identify several episodes of deeper ploughing, bringing fresh subsoil and artefacts to the surface. So, are there any more deeply buried late upper Paleolithic scatters which could be better preserved? And if so, how do we find them? Prior to 2010, 
the quantity of artefacts had focused attention within and north of the embayment, this blue area on the map. However, as this map shows, the artefacts south of the embayment are very sparse. But this is where we've turned our recent attention, because windblown cover sands were identified for the first time in the large-scale earth removing for the road construction. Two OSL dates from that scheme demonstrate that these cover sands were in place around 11,000 years ago, or of Younger Dryas age, the final cold stage before the present interglacial or Holocene. Nick Barton immediately recognised the potential significance of these cover sands, as they had the potential to bury the late glacial landscape of our hunter-gatherers. He was awarded a Society of Antiquaries grant for fieldwork to investigate his landscape. Augury and test pitting were conducted in 2015 and 16, with a community group providing the labour. The initial auger survey, led by Will Mills, showed sands, yellow here, laminated sediments, green, adjacent to the embayment, the blue of the fluvial deposits. The deepest cover sand deposit showed a complex sequence. The stratigraphy was identified by Simon Colcutt, with particle size by Diodata Tapiti and micromorphological analysis by Richard McPhail. The laminated sediments are seasonal, fluvial fine sands and silts consistent with a low energy flow in a cool climate deposition environment. The surface of these laminated deposits show signs of soil development. This sequence was subsequently subject to either desiccation and or cooling, producing polygonal cracking that also penetrated the underlying terrace sands and gravels. This cracking may have begun as the overlying silty cover loans were deposited. Two OSL samples were analysed by Mark Bateman. Initial estimates suggested ages that were far too young, perhaps because of the contamination by bioturbation. However, further examination of the scatter of single grain OSL measurements indicate an age of around 15,000 years ago for the laminated sediments and 12,000 for the overlying cover loans. These results suggest there is an extensive land surface of the right sort of age for late Paleolithic activity buried below the cover sands. We've not yet been successful in locating artefacts, but we've only test pitted 0.0015% of that deposit. I'll repeat that, 0.0015%. However, we know that this slightly elevated ground overlooks the embayment, so it could have been another prime spot similar to the cluster located north of the embayment. With help from Colin Baker and Simon Colcutt, we're gradually establishing the extent of that buried landscape with two new patches of cover sand identified to the east of the known scatter. Our modelling of that late glacial landscape is now not just of academic interest, as some 30% of the surviving laminated deposit below cover sand, i.e. the orange in the profile there, is under further threat of yet another new road linking to the A46. Cover sands are a feature of the East Midlands Lake Glacial, yellow on this map by Colin Baker after Brit Ice. On the basis of its recent recording at Farmden, it's probably more extensive downstream around the Trent and into North Lincolnshire than the current British Geological Survey mapping suggests. It is a difficult source to investigate, but late upper Paleolithic and specifically Federmes points have long been known from the cover sands around Miss Blisby Warren and Scunthorpe, uh, the blue dot and the artefact bottom right. 
though the cession of ironstone mining and measures to pr preserve the heathland habitat of the cover sands, uh, the opportunities for their chance recovery have declined. One aspect of Julia's work is to track down and reevaluate these finds. The cover sands can overlie low glacial peaks with their obvious potential for paleo-environmental information and sometimes lithics, as the scraper bottom left for messing. These sands continue to be quarried, as for example at Tilln in the Idle Valley. So as part of the planning process, there should be opportunities to examine these sequences as long as the schemes of treatment are des designed appropriately. For our late upper Paleolithic, this should be a high priority. The pale blue on this map shows the highest inferred extent of proglacial Lake Humber, impounded by ice or rains at the end of the Lake Glacial. We've only just started to think about its significance, if any, for our Lake Glacial archaeology. We're all familiar with the importance of Paleo Lakes in prehistory. Uh, Flixton Star Car, to mention just one. But Lake Humber is much less known. Recent landscape mapping by William Fairburn and Mark Bateman describe a recessional model with multiple lake levels nearing its demise by about 15,000. And note that the image here has heights over D, <coughs> not dates. Whilst there is debate amongst geologists as to the time and mode of its draining, it would have created a significant landscape paleo environment. So, were the laminated sediments at the base of our test pits, dated to around 15,000, part of the final demise of preceding Lake Humber, and we have mused, could it possibly have been this paleogeography that determined the roots of the herbivore herds between Doggerland and the Peak, and hence the location at Fondy of hunters that preyed on them. Something to think about further. I was going to say, Paul recognised this slide, it's his. As a persistent place, Fondy must have been on the route to and from somewhere else. Although Flint is found in the Trent gravels, Large nappable nodules of a size capable of producing some of the farmed blades are not known. So transport of flint is one clue to the movement of people. Paul Pettit, Marcy Rockman and Simon Chenry applied geochemical trace element analysis to a series of late upper Paleolithic sites to track the movement of raw materials. The prelim preliminary analysis by Rockman indicated southern sources around Pusey. More detailed work um, by Paul and Simon Chenry indicates a wider range of regional sources. But we have to note that as the work Flint is using derived till or river deposits, the specific location within the regions cannot be pinpointed. Simon Chenry at BGS has suggested that we try to turn this technique on its head, that is, Use it to test whether a scatter of tiny flakes are from few or many nodules, and do they match the tools from the same test pit? Simon has identified a methodology that would allow more speedy analysis than previously when 13 items from Fondham could be analysed. If this could be shown to be effective, it will bring down the time and cost of using this technique in the future, and perhaps provide an alternative to refitting where assemblages are obviously partial, as from our one to test pits. Results will be posted on our website, Ice Age Journeys. Tracking the movements of people is the theme we're, ex we're exploring in our current Heritage Lottery Fund grant. This allows us to actively encourage our participants to investigate the different resources at Creswell Crags and Broadgate Park. Besides being a bonus for visitor numbers, it also allows us to grapple with questions like how was the heavy flint transported? And were they crossing the rivers or using them as corridors? We'll also be considering if we're looking at the signature of the same group. 
we can at least observe that the distances between our East Midlands sites can be replicated in recent hunter-gatherer movements, like these three residential camps of one Eskimo family group recorded by Binford. We'll be playing with least cost path analysis and data from migration of American deer to provide clues and help generate discussion within our community group. You can be absolutely sure that we will ignore many constraints, but it will also focus our thoughts on use of the hunter-gatherer landscape. Can we strip back the modern developments to visualise our hunter-gatherers in theirs? Finally, Ice Age Journeys has been a real collaborative effort of community and professionals. The community giving manpower and life skills, accountancy, media, art and plumbing, just to name a few. <coughs> the professionals guiding us and we've all had fun. Many thanks to all contributors, particularly our charity trustees who've made this second phase possible, uh, plus of course our many sponsors. Thank you very much.